Early this year, sometime in June, the Straits Times ran an article that showed results from a survey. 20% of Singapore residents had no religious affiliations in 2020. This was a 3% increase since the year before, a rising trend since the 1980s. Among this, 24.2% were 15 to 24-year-olds. While this was not surprising to me, being a person of faith who believes in God and find a lot of value in religion to my life, I feel it's important for us to first understand how and why there's this rise in people having non-religious affiliations. And there's no better person to ask than Mr. Imran Taib, our guest for today. Muhammad Imran Muhammad Taib is the founder and board member of Singapore NGO Centre for Interfaith Understanding. He's also the director of intercultural consultancy Bodhi Private Limited. His involvement as an interfaith and Muslim activist spans close to two decades, serving in various organisations such as the Muslim Converts Association of Singapore, Centre for Contemporary Islamic Studies, Left Right Centre and the Reading Group. His writings have been published in various dailies, including The Straits Times, Channel News Asia, Today, Brita Harian, and South China Morning Post. He occasionally delivers guest lectures and presents papers in universities and international conferences. He is also the co-editor of several publications, including Buddhi Critic, a compilation of critical essays on Malay society published in 2019. Uh, Imran, firstly, assalamualaikum and welcome to the show. Appreciate you being here. Waalaikum salam. Thank you for having me here. My my pleasure. And uh, you you've always given us the time. Uh, more importantly, we regard you as a good friend of the community. Uh, the good and commendable work that you do in the faith. Uh, so okay, let's get into it. Sure. Uh, what you've been doing uh, in the interfaith, I, I think a lot a lot of people know. Uh, you have you are an interfaith advocate. Um, wherever there's interfaith work, we always see you. Uh, and I know, I think it was, what, six, seven years ago, you reached out to us and you've always been a good friend of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. So, w- curiously, personally, f- especially for me also, <laughs> I want to know, tell us your story, what's your background, how you came into interfaith work, uh, and more importantly, why are you doing this? Like, what's the motivation behind doing this? Sure, um... We have two hours, right, for me to tell my whole story? Yeah, just tell your whole story. It's all right. Uh, um, And it's... uh, Briefly, it's about my involvement in interfaith work. Um, So I would say that when I grew up, uh, I've always had uh, an interest in uh, uh, other religions. Um, Of course, me being born in a Muslim family, uh, being from uh, uh, parents who are culturally practicing Muslims, uh, in that sense that uh, our sense of religiosity has always been in the traditional sense where it's also uh, partaking in the cultural activities, uh, stroke religious activities that are often seen as part of the wider Malay communal practices. Uh, But um, I grew up in a period where there was also rising religiosity of a particular sort. Mm. Um, Today we, we call it religious revivalism or a more globally conscious uh, uh, movement of what it means to be a Muslim. Uh, so I've been interested in um, learning more about Islam from that perspective. And of course, I've been involved in a, a Muslim organization, uh, and uh, I was trained uh, to be a da'i, uh, uh, or you call it a mubalik. Mubalik. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, and at that time also there was... Um, I would say uh, a high degree of proselytization by other faiths, uh, in particular Christianity. So, so I, I don't know what, when, which period was this? Like uh, for me, I grew up uh, in the eighties. Okay, eighties. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and therefore, I I had encountered Christian missionaries, and uh, mm. um, and I was interested in uh, learning more about these interactions between Islam and Christianity. Um, right. Yep, so um, I grew up in that environment where I was uh, trained to how to respond to Christian missionary work. But of course, in my subsequent engagements with Christians and people of other faiths, I began to shift uh, a lot of my perspectives uh, through personal encounters because I began to see 
that it's not about convincing who's right and wrong. It's not simply debating issues, but it's also about building bonds of uh, friendship. Uh, and we do have the same struggles, the same issues, the same aspirations. And that set right. me thinking about uh, interfaith in a, a more inclusive sense. It's not about winning souls for heaven, is how you would say it, but rather about um, uh, learning and deepening each, uh, each other's uh, understanding of uh, the other faith, as well as understanding my own faith in a deeper sense through my encounters with people of other faith. So that set me on a journey of interfaith, which I've not stopped till now. Right. Uh, thanks for sharing. I mean, that, that's... Uh uh, like, like I say, it's always to us. It's always been very commendable, you know. And 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 stepping out there, talking to lots and lots of different groups, uh, which comes to the topic of today, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I guess previously, this wasn't in the conversation when we talk about interfaith. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, learning about other people's faith. And traditionally, it's always been religions, right? Um, now, I would say, uh, not in a mocking sense, or or, or really in a uh, respect full way there's a new kid in the block mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, people who are non-religious mm-hmm. but who uh, I know through friends through reading here and there they express themselves to like they want to be part of the discussion right mm-hmm. uh, so let's get into this I think for the audience especially there uh, this group is big um, you have uh, all these terms atheists agnostics free thinkers humanists I'm sure there are others Break it down for us, if you can, Imran. Like, what are the difference? Just basically, uh, for our audience to understand, and we, if we use these terms, at least they can relate to uh, who uh, we are talking about. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, I think what you are referring to uh, are those who, in the census of population, would declare themselves not to belong to any uh, faith group. Yes. Um, so there are multiple uh, terms that are used for this category of people, and um, I wouldn't say that uh, all of them have no religion, uh, because some really do have uh, their own personal belief about God, about reality, about religion itself, mm-hmm. but they simply do not want to be boxed into any kind of official or institutionalized form of religion. Um, so. It's really a, a, a mix uh, of people that are in this category. Of course, um, uh, many of them would be self-professing atheists. Uh, and even the term atheist itself is something that needs to be unpacked further. Uh, of course, from, from the term uh, A and theist, that means uh, has no notion of God. Mm. But we can also uh, divide it into possibly two large categories, those who are passively atheists, in the sense that they grew up uh, or, or God simply doesn't feature anything at all in their lives and they don't even think about God. So in that sense, they really have no notion of God or whatever you call that supernatural mm-hmm. being. Yeah, But of course, amongst them also, there will be those who are, I would call as more uh, active atheists. That means actively denying that there is a, a, a supernatural being uh, out there. Then, of course, there are those who will suspend their judgment uh, in the sense that they think that there's no way of finding out whether there is a God or not uh, mm-hmm. because human minds are too limited. We don't even understand the whole cosmos and the universe. How much more can we understand things that are outside the material world? So they will call themselves possibly as agnostics. Um, of course, the agnostics also, there are those who are more passive in the sense that, you know, they don't really think much about this whole idea, whether God exists or not. Uh, but there are those who uh, actively assert that, yes, uh, there's no way of knowing. Then, of course, there are also that, uh, the category that in Singapore it's quite unique because we, uh, there are a group of people who call themselves as free thinkers. Free thinkers, yeah. Yep. Uh, and sometimes that gets conflated also with a lot of other terms like ATs, agnostics. But free thinkers uh, are people who, are, who simply does not want to be uh, boxed into a particular way of thinking through the religious lens. So they right. are free to use their own uh, assessment, rationality, and thinking about uh, all kinds of things, including religion. So free thinkers may be having a religion, or some don't have a religion. It's just a mode of being 
uh, open mindedness open mindedness like, yeah. but right again open mindedness also i have to qualify that it doesn't mean that religious people are not open minded yeah uh, it's just that religious people's open mindedness is still uh, within the framework of their religious yeah. thinking yeah whereas uh, free thinkers would be much more freer uh, right. and then there are those who are known as uh, humanists and this is where it's interesting because we have uh, the humanist international that has defined what it means to be a humanist uh, and i think there are about uh, many aspects of it is something that does not exclude religion in the sense that mm. uh, being ethical and uh, uh, thinking in terms of rationality um, and uh, put basically the idea of putting the humane and the humanity in the center of uh, our being and our lives. Uh, uh, but there's one element uh, that, that actually separates uh, uh, people with religion and the humanists uh, according to the de definition of the international humanist, and this is about uh, believing in a supernatural being uh, or supernatural explanations for natural phenomenon. Uh, of course, uh, that would mean that humanists would be in the categories of atheists or agnostics and things like that. Right. Okay. But I do know that uh, there are people of religion who also call themselves as humanists because uh, uh, they believe that at the center of the universe is still the idea of being human, uh, but of course being human does not exclude uh, believing in God. Um, right. And humanism itself started from religion, actually. Have you see, if we were to see uh, the development in Christianity, for example, some of the early humanists were actually Christian thinkers. Right, yep. okay. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard, for example, would be considered as a humanist. Uh, mm. uh, um, in Muslim tradition also, we do have uh, humanist mm. Muslims, uh, people who are well-learned and scientists who develop ethical theories uh, and pursuing the good of humanity. They call themselves, or, or we call them as humanists also, but they, of course they are Muslims and they are believers in God. Um, that is why there is also another category that is emerging right now that is called spiritual but not religious. Yep. So this is another interesting yep. category. Uh, so this refers to people who are who believes that there is something transcendental uh, beyond mm. just uh, the material sense and uh, the human. Uh, and there's uh, a lot of the unknowns out there. Uh, and it could be whatever you call it, God, divine, mystery, whatever it is. So they feel that awe and wonder of the, mm. that transcends the, the just that material, material realm. Uh, but they do not subscribe to the institutionalized form of religion. Right. So uh, would you say they kind of reject like the idea of deities? Mainly? They what? Like, Sorry? They, they reject the idea of deities? Uh, uh, God. Not necessary. Not necessary. Not necessary? Okay. Some, some of them do still accept the idea of a deity. Uh, um, uh, but probably they will reject uh, the definition of God as how it's been mm. defined within... Uh, very official lines uh, by institutionalized form of religions. So they are free to explore their own spirituality and connect with the divine uh, in ways that are not tied down to the way rituals or practices or ways of believing have been developed in the official world religions uh, that we have seen right now. So, so there, there, there are many, many <laughs> terms as you can see. It's a very complex phenomenon. I will say it's better to think of it in terms of a spectrum rather than a monolithic group. Yeah. And I guess that that's very important for us and uh, uh, people who are religious and non-religious and our audience in general to understand like it's such a diverse group and uh, there's intersections also. I, I guess from you explaining to me there are intersections of like religious people subscribing to ethical, uh, this intersection of ethical humanism, you know, and then people who don't believe in God also intersecting here and there. So I think, I think it's very good for us yeah. to... Uh, understand that um, one sorry know, uh, uh, let yeah, me ahead, just add, add a, a bit more um, one way is actually to allow people to uh, define it themselves uh, rather than us mm. uh, coming up with a That's category to actually yeah. <laughs> you know impose it on them so le le at, let yeah. people uh, define themselves uh, what they believe and, and call whatever that they're comfortable calling themselves uh, right. yeah so so in in the west for example um, the term nons uh, is more widely used n-o-n-e-s mm. Uh, so it could be, uh, it, it's all this spectrum uh, will be considered the nonce. Um, 
even the term non-religious uh, can be quite contentious. Uh, what does being non-religious mean? So you have to define what does religiosity mean in the first place. So if people sure. don't subscribe to that kind of religiosity, then they'll be non-religious. Or does non-religious specifically refers to people who reject or are anti-religion? So all these uh, nuances need to to be to, to be fleshed out, and it's important not to impose a particular label uh, and let people define it themselves. Right. Yeah. I I believe even for like people when you do a survey about religion, mm. are you religious? Uh, <laughs> like you can subscribe to a religion, but you are not necessarily of course, practicing yeah. it. So yeah. I why well, are you defined then? Yeah. I I get what you're saying. Uh, that's great. Uh, yeah. So, so moving on. Next question that that I have. Um, now let's talk in the context of Singapore. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, if you have any idea from your research, like, uh, do do you have do you have any? I know I know this is a bit tough because I couldn't find myself. But like, what percentage of people are actually like uh, atheists, pure atheists? That means they totally mm-hmm. reject the idea altogether. Uh, and then, uh, okay, for me, I'm I'm just dumping it down. Okay, mm-hmm. they are atheists. And uh, agnostic means uh, I'm not I'm not sure. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, do you have any like breakdown of people who truly reject it and feel there's no no need for religion at all? Uh, I would consider them atheists. And uh, agnostics means uh, to me it's like free thinkers. So uh, I'm I'm not sure. And they're pretty open minded about different religions and things like that. Is there any breakdown any such data? Um, there isn't such uh, data. Uh. Uh, if you're lo- looking at Singapore in particular. Um, mm. So um, what we do have, like, for example, the last census of population, right? So 20% uh, do not subscribe to any religion, um, at least as how we understood it uh, being listed out, Islam, Christianity, right. Buddhism, etc. Uh, but out of this 20%, uh, again, it's a spectrum, as how I've mentioned mm. earlier. So we don't have further data on that. Uh, many of them actually, uh, uh, I wouldn't say, sorry, I wouldn't say many of them. I would say a certain portion of them would be comfortable uh, uh, being uh, included in groups like uh, Humanist Society of Singapore, mm-hmm. uh, which was registered in 2010. Um, uh, and they have been a shelter for people who simply has uh, fall out of religion. Right. Um, but uh, amongst them, I do know that, uh, of course, quite a significant number are ATs within the humanist society. Uh, but there are also many who uh, does not uh, call themselves as ATs. Um, but really, we don't have further data um, mm-hmm. unless we do a, a, a study on that. Right. Okay, cool. Um, so let's, let's talk about um, uh, people living religion i mean uh, in my understanding uh definitely uh I, I guess majority of the population in the past was religious i feel uh, in through my own research and things like that they subscribe to one of the traditional religions islam christianity those was what we commonly know so there's this rate of increase in uh, people who now identify themselves as non-religious mm-hmm. all right uh, so my question is do you see um that the rate in the rise of the non-religious group people faster than the rate of people converting to religion. Uh, to give context also, I, 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 I came across a Pew Research globally that shows that, uh, weirdly, I might be wrong on this, uh, but I double check, uh, religion was still, actually it's increasing and somehow another, uh, because of, I think population growth, yes. somehow another... Uh, Non-religious group has a slight dip, although it's generally increasing over the many years. Um, yeah. So in Singapore, do you think that um, there then be any a- analysis that says that uh, the rise in non-religious will mm. be faster than people converting to a religion? Well, um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. But um, I would say right, um, right now... Um, some of the data shows that uh, globally, uh, about 7% uh, self-professed ATS, uh, mm. which is not a very big number uh, if you look at, at the total world population. So a yeah. significant number still people who belong to one or the other religious faith or tradition. Uh, and if you look at population growth, and you are right, uh, that itself, if supposedly 
uh, people remain in the faith that they are born in, and very mm. few would want to declare that they uh, have abandoned religion totally. Uh, and also, we are excluding people who actually do religious switching. Yeah, they still they still fall yes. within the category of uh, being in one religious tradition or another. Um, then, I would say it's right to say that uh, at least we would see not a decline in religion. Um, uh, but what we are seeing, uh, at least from some data that, that we, we've seen, um, in more developed countries, people tend to uh, uh, lose religion uh, mm. more than developing countries. Right. Um, uh, China is interesting because China uh, has a huge, uh, the world's largest uh, population, uh, and uh, they are largely uh, atheists, and the state itself profess uh, not to have religion. Uh, so that itself uh, is an anomaly. Uh, mm. So if you look at Singapore, um, of course there has been quite a, a steady increase uh, of people who do not subscribe to any religion. Um, if we were to look, for example, yeah, uh, just give me a moment. Yeah, uh, if you look at 2016, for example, uh, Sorry, uh, 2010. We have 17 percent of the population uh, professing to have no religious affiliation, uh, and that moved to 18.5 percent by 2015. And right now, we have seen 20 percent. Uh, and uh, according to the latest, uh, or at least uh, the the studies that have been done looking at this data, uh, it tends to be from the younger generation. Yeah. Uh, and Singapore, it's uh, a developed country. Uh, quite similar in terms of quality of life uh, as uh, many Western countries. Uh, and you would see, um, I would think that it will continue to increase uh, right. over the years. Um, and that has got to do also with uh, the secularization process uh, that leads to individuation. Individuation means that there's greater uh, recognition of uh, your own personal choices. Mm. Uh, and with the scientific uh, approach to education will provide alternative ways of looking at the world, uh, which previously has been monopolized by religious views. Right. Uh, so um, I think a lot of these factors will point to a direction where younger people will grow up uh, having no religion. But uh, we should not also underestimate the psychological uh, conditions of humans uh, Self. So some people are, say, are saying that, you know, um, as you grow older, you tend to be more religious. <laughs> they might yes. reconnect with religion. Uh, yeah. And also we can't predict what is going to happen in the world because when there's a lot yeah. of fears, anxieties, uncertainties in life, people tend to dig into uh, the deeper sense of their being and that's where they try to reconnect back with religion. Right. Uh, it may not be in the form of religion as how we have seen it uh, and uh, how we have seen uh, uh, operating and expressed through institutional forms, but mm. nonetheless, it's the homo religios, religiousness that we are looking at. People who want something beyond just this material world. Uh, right. yeah. Yeah. But it might not be in the way that we are familiar with uh, in traditional forms mm. of religion. Yeah. That, that's interesting to think about that. Yeah, I mean, all this data about, you know, uh, the youth and also coming from first world countries. I, I guess we'll come into that later, like why, but uh, mm -hmm. let's, let's get into the discussion. Why, why, why do we think? Uh, uh, but, but I just want to come on to a point of, uh, in terms of this movement of uh, peop uh, people leaving their parents' religion, especially the youths, you know, things like that. Which religious groups are they coming from? I'm talking more in Singapore context. Like, uh, just out of curiosity. People who, um, who, are, uh, who, um, who choose to subscribe to a non-religious belief and this rise, I guess you uh -huh. see the stats going. Yeah. Which religious groups are, are they formally coming from or their parents were from, you know, like their household traditionally? Mm. Do you have any idea? Um, I've not looked closely at the data. Um, but of course, uh, we do know that uh, the, there's a high degree of religiosity amongst the Malay community. Uh, so they have the uh, lowest number of people who subscribe to non-belief. Right. Um, if you look at the 
by the majority population, the Chinese, for example, yes, uh, there has been significant in increase. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I've not looked at it in terms of the breakdown amongst the different religion, uh, because we have to compare that with statistics of uh, religious switching. Uh, right. Yeah, it, we we can't just look at people who from having a religion to no religion, but we have to compare also whether when they leave that particular religion, do they change their religion or change religion, yeah. or they they simply uh, drop out of faith? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so so let's get into that. Like, why do you think are the main reasons why people are leaving their born religions and subscribing to a non-religious uh, view, whether it's atheism or agnostic? Mm. Like that. What are the common reasons usually? Well. Um, there might be a few uh, factors. Um, I've mentioned about this uh, whole uh, secularization process that leads to individuation, uh, where people have more choices and they are free to explore uh, um, um, out of that buffet of belief systems or ways of looking at the world. <clears throat> uh, and of course, the rise of science and rationality itself uh, points to a way of looking at the world that, to some extent, does not re need religion to explain phenomena. Uh, yeah. In the past, possibly when you don't understand how certain uh, natural phenomenon occurred, you, you, you will be much more predisposed to think in terms of the supernatural. But uh, now with rise in scientific thinking, people find that they no longer need to appeal to religious explanations. Uh, and science makes sense, uh, and uh, using rationality to uncover the, 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 the natural world um, is something that does not need religion to, 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 to explain. Uh, there's also, I think, and this is something that we uh, often don't talk about, it is the failures of certain aspects of the, the religious institutions to make itself relevant to the world amidst the changing context of society. And that also speaks about failures in certain aspects of leadership, religious leadership, that are not able to communicate as well as look into serious reforms mm. uh, within the religious institutions that can now appeal to a changing rationality and a changing context of society. So the tendency, if you look, uh, not in Singapore uh, in particular, but we let's look at the global scene, um, the religious institutions, when it tends to lose traction amongst the people, they tend to dig in and they turn towards authoritarianism, which then pushes back uh, people from religion. And that is the situation that might develop here also in the sense that mm. religious authorities become much more authoritarian because they felt that they are losing ground and they want to dig in then the younger generation will also push back because authoritarianism will never ever convince people of truth. Uh, and we are seeing, interestingly, there has been very little study, but at least from the few studies that has been done, we are seeing a rise of atheism in the Middle East in Muslim countries. Yep. And uh, there was one uh, by Brian Whitaker that, of course, uh, it's kind of anecdotal and uh, a, a, a mesh of data from various sources, seems to point that the more authoritarian the religious structure is in a particular country, the higher the number of self-professed atheists. Is it because, I mean, like, taking away this natural human tendency to want to reason, you know, and, and having this dogmatic thing placed on you, and you cannot go re out of that, right? Like, in this authoritarian, uh, religious authoritarian context, and there is no circular space. You know, there's no... There's no there's no room for you to actually enter a secular space. Everything is defined for you um, through just that one messaging. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because we are living in a, in a different context uh, of the modern world where mm. rationality is, 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 is very high. Uh, uh, and it has seeped into the education and the upbringing where people need to be uh, uh, risen out with. Uh, and, and, and it's no longer a case where people can be uh, forced into a particular belief system. Um, and of course, in a, uh, a modern context where um, freedom of religion is upheld and strongly believed in, 
then any violations of freedom of religion will not be will not augur well for the religious institution, and therefore the tendency will be for people to reject. Right. Yeah. Of course, there, uh, in the modern in the modern context also, we have seen the rise of a lot of uh, violence and problems too. Mm. Um, if you look at the Muslim world, for example, um, a lot of writings uh, 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 that. Uh, openly announced themselves to have fallen out of Islam and embracing atheism seem to have emerged uh, uh, and correspond to the period after September 11. Mm. So I think there is something there uh, has... Right. Uh, Identity crisis, this kind of thing? Uh, possibly because... You see, I think it's, a, it's got to do with authoritarianism again. Mm. Because if there's only one religious way of interpreting, understanding and knowing uh, and it's being imposed uh, and if that monolithic presentation of Islam is violent, uh, is something that wants to dominate uh, and rule over the entire world and if people were to reject that what other choices do they have? They either right. agree with yeah. that or they leave the religion or they, sure. they reject it, right? So I think Religious authoritarianism will not help uh, in terms of opening up the spaces for people to actually to think about religion in a more complex, nuanced, and uh, in, in different ways. Right. I, I guess so. You have touched on like uh, okay, these different reasons of uh, one of it, which I truly uh, agree with you, like the religious authoritarianism in all these countries, you know, and then you can see the rise of that pushback of the youths. And of course, the other thing being um, science, right? Which what you mentioned. Uh, and you were talking a bit about like, accessibility. Uh, my question is, okay, I, I just to... Uh, like, personally, mm -hmm. when I grew up, uh, being an Ahmadi Muslim, um, uh, never had this kind of clash between religion. I'm not talking about myself, but I also I think generally Muslims here in Singapore, this region, never had this clash between science and religion. Uh, we are always taught and I still subscribe to today uh, the, the Quran is the word of God whereas everything else is uh, his works right and you need to understand science fully right and science change you know and things like that uh, so let's just talk about this a bit in terms of science because uh, in just to quote uh, also a reason gave by Dr. Matthews from uh, uh, IPS, all right. Like people rely less on religion to provide them an explanation for the many things that happen in life, but instead look at the sciences. So he was answering in terms of like, what's the possibility of uh, why people are living their religion? And religion as an institution is no longer playing a major role in one's life, and so fewer people will pass faith down to their children. Uh, so what are the nuances in terms of understanding what science really is? Uh, do, do, do you think that leads to this disbelief in God and religion, per se? Um. Um, I think firstly, we have to understand that uh, science and religion are two separate entities uh, that aims to answer two different set of questions. Uh, and this is where sometimes uh, I would disagree with people who say that science can prove religion, uh, religious truths, uh, in ways that are very positivist. Yeah, uh, like for example, uh, science can prove the existence of God. Um, to me, I think that is rather naive. Um, mm. uh, science can never prove nor disprove the existence of God because science has its own methodology and it okay. talks about the natural phenomena uh, and, and things that can be proven through the scientific method. But here we are talking about being that transcends uh, mm. the natural world uh, and it subscribes to a whole different... Uh, idea of rationality. Um, science explains how things are, but religion explains the meaning behind right. things that happen. So uh, that is why um, science and religion can actually coexist because they answer different sets of questions. Um, one very interesting uh, study by an anthropologist, uh, Evans Prickard, for example, of the Azande tribe, uh, Sometimes we think that people who believe in um, religious explanations are irrational, right? 
Um, but his anthropological studies points to the Azande tribe has uh, those who, I mean, they, they believe um, uh, in perfectly rational explanation on why, why uh, the roof of the house collapsed uh, uh, upon them. Uh, and they were able to explain in terms of cause and effect because the termites eat through the wood, the wood collapse. Yeah? But at the same time, they also believe that there's the meaning behind why the roof collapsed at that particular time to that particular person. That is explained by right. their superstitious belief that someone uh, must have sent uh, some kind of black magic. You know? So these mm -hmm. two can coexist. So this is where I think it's rather uh, simplistic to say that science is rational, uh, religion is irrational. I think there is a third right. category known as the non-rational, things that can neither be proven nor disproven by science. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's interesting. Uh, uh, I don't know if you have heard about this. Like, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's just uniquely to the Ahmadi Muslim community. Like, for example, talking about... Um, because these are discussions that I have with my friends, you know. Uh, I'm not talking about just uh, Muslims among Muslims, but even like uh, non-Muslims, Christians, and things like that. I'm uh, just talking about like miracles, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you can see many of people in my generation, youths, are very like they couldn't grab their, uh, they could they couldn't cannot understand this concept of miracles, um, because it goes ag against like science and things like that. One one very good example is the splitting of the sea by Moses. Subscribed by three major religions, right? This story, um, and 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 f uh, f just just sharing to audience, like uh, mm -hmm. I I find it perfectly rational that, uh, okay, what is the miracle actually, right? I don't uh, that the miracle is knowing when, uh, or that the the getting a divine revelation, you know, which is something, nothing to do with science, right? There's divine revelation. That knowing that when the sea will part, but what's the science behind it? There is a science behind it. It's not just that that the sea parted, right? Uh, we know about tides moving away, mm. you know, possibly and revealing bridges. We don't know exactly what the factual historical thing that really happened, uh, but we can draw conclusions if you want to talk about science. Possibly these are all things happen, you know. So there's always this reconciliation between. Um, uh, 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 what happened in the scripture, and also whether this is possible in science, you know, and things like that. Hmm. Uh, j just touching on that, <laughs> I, I guess it's similar, you know, putting in like this understanding. Uh, uh, but whereas many people who were were brought up in households, which I see some of my friends who were, who were very strict in terms of their um, understanding of this kind of things, perhaps goes against their rationality and things, and then it's that pushback of like, no, I, c I cannot, you know. Science tells me otherwise. There's no such thing as you know, blah blah blah. Sea cannot part, you know, and people cannot move through it. Things like <laughs> that. Uh, yeah. Any any comments on that? Uh, it was just my thoughts, mm. really. Just going. Yeah. Over, but, uh, yeah. Actually, it's very interesting um, because that's at the very heart of the debate uh, in early Islam, even uh, between the rationalist mm, exactly. school of thought, the Mutazilas, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, who uh, really developed the whole uh, uh, scientific fields, uh, in, in whether mm. astronomy, physics, and, and they're deeply religious. Uh, Mm. Uh, uh, Muslims um, who are inspired by what the Quran promulga pro promulgated about the use of reason or akal, right? Yes. Um, like, do you not think, you know, Afala Takilun, for example, you mm. know, uh, and there's many verses in the Quran that actually promotes the use of reason yep. uh, and the use of akal. Uh, and the Mutazilas uh, really pursued that and developed it, uh, and they would see the world in terms of. The Sunnatullah, or God has uh, ordained uh, certain cause and effect, and they were to uncover it and they were to discover it. And many of them right. were scientists during that period of time, yeah. Uh, but of course, it, that it led to that inquisitiveness, right? Like, like they want to find out why exactly. right, all this happened. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, but of course, there is another st uh, strain of theology uh, which is known as atomic occasionalism, and that seems to be mm. never prevalent way of understanding within the orthodox uh, Sunni world today, uh, which is known as the Ash'ari school of, of thought. Um, and it is the idea that what you are seeing is just uh, uh, not cause and effect, but rather, um, what is the term to use? That, um, um, a sequence of events, mm. right? Because one of the concern was how do you then prove miracles 
like for example when Abraham was thrown into the fire and mm. if the fire uh, has to act uh, in terms of fire has the property of burning and, and how come Abraham doesn't get burned and how do you explain that? Uh, of course the explanation right. is that there is no uh, natural property of, of, of fire to burn, uh, it's God that actually causes things to burn or not. Mm. Uh, so there is the whole idea of divine uh, interventions in every phenomenon in the world. Uh, and that actually allows uh, us to accept the understanding of miracles. Uh, but right. of course, this is a continuous tension in the Muslim world uh, being debated. And uh, there is a person in India, uh, by, uh, known by the uh, by, by his name as uh, Said Ahmad Khan, who developed uh, a tafsir of the Quran, and he tried uh, to explain away miracles in the Quran through scientific terms. Uh, um, of course, um, whether he succeeded or not, that's debatable, and of course, he met with a lot of opposition. But he was in the period of the what uh, uh, ninth, uh, 19th century, uh, and that was when the Muslim world encountered the uh, European sciences right. uh, and he believed in science being able to explain every phenomenon uh, and therefore he tried to use scientific explanations to explain as what you mentioned, probably mm. the splitting of the Red Sea, uh, there's some scientific explanations behind it. Uh, um, but of course today uh, many Muslims will not subscribe to this kind of way of believing because they would still want to um, uphold the, the miraculousness mm. uh, uh, of things and that also because the Quran has a lot of uh, stories of miracles of the prophets right. uh, but of course there will be those who will downplay it and say maybe the Quran needs to be approached from a metaphorical sense uh, because right now we are seeing less and less miracles but we are seeing more and more uh, natural explanations for things that are happening so right. we cannot go to a situation where every single thing that we don't understand, we say it's supernatural. Uh, and then that doesn't really push us also to discover uh, things around us because if we just delegate it to a supernatural right. way of being and that God causes this and that puts a full stop. Uh, and I think the Muslim world really need to think about how to promote scientific thinking uh, and not, like, uh, not let the idea of miracles uh, pull them down. Uh, right, and I guess this leads to that clash of uh, reasoning, rationality, exactly. and also this accessibility of this information with uh, religious uh, intolerance of like uh, uh, understanding uh, one particular way. Uh, which comes to final question, I will say is the probably the most important question that I want to ask you. Uh, do you think this whole phenomenon of uh, this rise in uh, non-religious uh, atheism and things like that? Is this a God problem or a religion problem? Uh, <laughs> I, I have that distinction because in my <laughs> conversations with many people, mm -hmm. it is different, you know? Mm. It is very different. Uh, uh, maybe you can ex um, share what do you mean by God problem? Uh, so there are people who reject uh, the religions where their households come from, their parents come from, mainly because of the idea of disbelieving in God, like, uh, the, like uh, this supernatural being, I, I guess you talk, you talk, uh, you touch about this a lot uh, just now. But um, and there are many who reject the the human aspect of faith. That you know, these mm. people, uh, clergy, uh, this uh, this um, this social influence of, of 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 religion, corruption, you know, and things like that. That they really hate. Uh, that goes against their. Um, it, it disappoints them, you know, and things mm. like that. Mm. And I see kind of like a split between these two, uh, uh, in terms of my friends, you know, and things mm. like that. Like, like some really, it, it's really about faith. Like, uh, put religion aside. Really, I don't believe in God, you know, through, through signs and things like that. I don't see there's no there's no evidence. There's another group that are very disappointed in religion. Mm. I would say I, I would say that's the kind of like what they are saying. Um, so so hence my question. Uh, God problem or religion problem um, in terms of this rise? Yeah, of course, I, 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 I think there's a bit of both. Hmm. Um, if I can, un um, in my understanding, when you mention about God problem, I think it's got to do with how God is being represented hmm. or defined. Uh, and I think some people might have a problem with that. So it's not a rejection of God in total, but it's a rejection of 
how God has been explained to them or how God has been defined for them, uh, which doesn't make sense to, to them perhaps anymore. Uh, and this has got to do with the tendency to anthropomorphize God, making God in the image of humans. Mm. Yep. Uh, uh, this is interesting because we, we were taught that uh, humans are made in the image of God, but mm. hu humans also made God in the image of man, right? So, for example, uh, again, we go back to the idea of authoritarianism, right? So, mm. some people would push for the idea of God being this very scary, punishing, uh, mm. vengeful God. Eventual God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the whole religious instruction has been revolving around the idea of punishments, especially torture and hellfire. Now, a lot of the younger generation, when they grew up, they couldn't subscribe to this kind of vision of God. What mm. kind of a God will punish you eternally for doing things that are seem to be minute, you know? Right. Uh, and so much of torture that you lose this idea that God is also our Rahman and our Rahim. Yeah. Uh, and they couldn't deal with these contradictions, right? Uh, but of course, we know that uh, that is how God has been represented by certain groups of people, and it's not necessarily what God is like. Yeah. Because if you know the word uh, Allahu Akbar, for example, God is not, Allahu Akbar is not simply God is the greatest. God is greater than. And whatever humans can think of God, God mm. is not that. So this is where it's interesting if we subscribe to negative theology. Negative theology means that you can't really say what God is like because our human mm. minds are so limited. What we can do at most is to say what God is not. So if you say God is like this, no, it's God is greater than that. God is like that, no, God is greater than that. So it, it opens up a whole new avenue of thinking about God. And people are not being taught to think about God in this way. Instead, right. to think of God in a certain way that has anthropomorphized God, and actually people are reacting against that. Right. Yeah. Uh, just to get you, you, it's like really humanizing God. Like that, that's what they were growing up with this idea, yeah. right? And then you have the problem of evil, which has been a perennial problem in, in, uh, uh, in thinking about God. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole uh, idea, the three postulates, like God is all loving. God is all-knowing and God is all-powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and these three cannot sit together yeah. without producing a contradiction in the face of evil. So if God is all-powerful, uh, why didn't he remove evil? Uh, or why, why is there suffering? Yeah, why is there suffering? Uh, if God is all-knowing, uh, he would know that there's going to be suffering. And why didn't he intervene, for example, right. and stop Hitler from killing uh, millions yeah. of Jews? Uh, if God is all loving, then it creates a problem because God doesn't seem to be doing anything. And there is the very interesting novel, uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, the Russian novelist who wrote, uh, right. uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was it uh, uh, Brothers Kamarazov? Yeah, uh, and I think uh, it's quite telling. Uh, if you to save humanity, you have to torture and eventually kill this infant. Will mm. you do it? Now, as human beings, we have very limited capacity for love and compassion. We will struggle with that. Right. Right? Cr what? Crime and Prejudice? Uh, no, no. This is a book, uh, the book called Brothers Kamarazov. Bro okay. okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. He has many novels, like Crime Similar, and Punishment, yeah, yeah. and there's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. a few other novels. Uh, so even if we as humans, we struggle with this idea, uh, what more if we say God is all loving, and yet there's so much suffering? And I think this problem of suffering and evil uh, is especially ac acute uh, in the 20th century when we face with uh, violence at the global scale, especially right. world the, wars. the two world wars, yeah. exactly, and massacres and genocides happening, and people are now asking, where is God right. in the midst of all this? Exactly. Of course, there's yeah. theodicies, that means way of explaining why evil exists, but I think, uh, well, it's a whole uh, debate that we have to, uh, we don't have time to unpack a lot of this, but... Right. For many people, this is a real struggle that has actually led them to abandon the traditional idea of God at the very least, if not religion entirely. Yeah, this, this was the central discussion in like my university, for example, uh, when we did uh, religious philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more on philosophy, really the philosophical aspects and this uh, really putting the concept of God towards the test. And, of and, and I agree with you. I mean, as someone who has studied this very long, I read all the 
philosophies and things mm-hmm. like that. Uh, however, I do subscribe to both philosophical rational, uh, r- rationality, reasoning, and also the spiritual experiences of people. Mm. Right. I think that that needs to be both. But I see what people go through is uh, the rejection of God mainly uh, comes from this philosophy, unable to get the real answers, uh, or they're not exposed to the answers of, uh, of, of and and not to fall of their own though. I think we have to answer these questions ourselves. Uh, people who have faith. Um, great. I uh, I it's very interesting to talk to you as always, Imran. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have come to end. I've actually yes. so much, so many more questions, yeah. and uh, yeah. hopefully, I can bring you on further podcast. Maybe we can even deep dive into certain aspects of this, or maybe other topics. Uh. Your insights have always been valuable. Truly appreciate your time. Uh, you've always been a good friend to the Ahmadi Muslim community here. Uh, thank you so much, Imran. Anything else you want to say? No, I think uh, thank you for having me on the show. I think uh, this kind of conversations, of course, uh, um, will not end here uh, yeah. because these are <laughs> things that people are continuously discussing. And I'm glad yes. that you have opened up the spaces for us to think further about these issues and engage right. each other. And um, I want to commend the works, the good works of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community for giving the spaces for these kind of engagements and dialogues to occur. Um, I think as a society, we have to evolve into this kind of mode of engagements where right. we are willing to actually discuss these serious issues, but not allowing our differences of views to actually tear us apart or True. create a divisiveness. And I think that speaks to uh, the good work that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has been doing uh, in interfaith and also in bridging uh, uh, differences and bringing dialogues to people of different sectors. Right. Thank At you. the end of the day, yeah, it's really about bringing people together, right? understanding each other. I mean, we can have different views, but uh, we want harmony. I, I guess that's all our uh, our end goal. You know, is uh, we want ke- we live in a country and we live in this tiny island and we want to get along with each other. Mm-hmm. And and I think to 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 me, uh, that's why I really commend what you do. Likewise, in terms of w- what you do in terms of interfaith, uh, what w- what we do as well, it's it's all about. We need to understand the differences of people, mm-hmm. you know, to truly appreciate them as uh, fellow Singaporeans, you know, and things. Like that. And not always need not just that, but also to uh, reduce the prejudices and the stereotyping. True. Yes, um, definitely. And since we are talking about um, the the atheists or humanists or uh, uh, whatever terminology is being used, I think it's important not to see them through stereotypical lens. And one of the main stereotypes that the community has to struggle with is the idea where the atheists can be morally upright and whether they can have ethical values without a religion. Right. I think in, in my engagements with them, I, I find them to be highly moral people, uh, deeply ethical and reflective and sad to say, uh, some of them are even much more morally upright and ethical than even people from our own faith. Right, exactly, yeah. And it's wrong to judge them, right? And, and say that, oh, just because you don't have a religion, you're immoral. Uh, we can have a discussion what is like the best path or, or what's the difference of views in terms of why religion is better, things like that, in a very mutual, uh, uh, without prejudices, which I agree with you. I think that's that's the crux, right? Without prejudices and truly trying to understand each other. Yeah. Um, thank you once again Imran uh, let's <laughs> end this session uh, wonderful to have you on and hopefully we can have a discussion again in the future thank, thank you. you so much thank you Assalamualaikum Waalaikumsalam <laughs>